Welcome to Middle School Science Prep, Module 10, Roles of Water in the Earth's Surface Processes. This is a partnership with TLC Tutoring Company and Arkansas State University. Let's begin with the distribution of water. You've probably heard before that 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. But how much of that water is fresh water accessible to humans for things like drinking and bathing? Earth's oceans are vast and deep, and as such, they account for 97% of all of the Earth's water. That only leaves 3% as fresh water, the majority of which is frozen in ice caps and glaciers around the world. Now, the water cycle is simply that the water molecules on Earth today are the same water molecules that have been on Earth for billions of years. These water molecules have been moved around the world, circulating through oceans, evaporating in the air, and falling to the ground as precipitation. This movement of water is called the water cycle. The water cycle is vital for driving global climate and weather. And as you can see in this diagram, the water cycle is cyclical, meaning it moves in a perpetual circle. All water that evaporates will eventually fall as precipitation. That precipitation will eventually collect in lakes or the ocean, and then will evaporate and continue the cycle. There are several ways water can change form during that water cycle. Evaporation is the transformation of water from a liquid to a vapor, or gas. This is driven largely by heat from the sun, and a majority of the evaporation occurs with ocean water. Sublimation occurs when solid water, ice, snow, instantly transforms to a gas without first becoming a liquid. This primarily occurs at high altitudes and other places with ice and snow. Transpiration is the process of water vapor evaporating from plant leaves. For more on this, review Module 5. There are several ways water can change forms during that cycle as well. Precipitation occurs when the water vapor condenses and becomes too heavy to stay in the air. Precipitation can fall as rain, hail, snow, or sleet. Condensation is a water vapor becoming a liquid, which is, you know, could be used in cloud formation and dew, like you see on the grass early in the morning. Runoff, water that isn't absorbed by the ground during precipitation forms runoff, which eventually flows into streams and rivers. Infiltration occurs when water seeps into the ground. Often large amounts of water are stored in the ground deep underneath our feet. The water in Earth's oceans may seem relatively still, but it's actually constantly in motion. Waves, tides, and currents are all forms of ocean water movement. Waves are primarily created by the wind blowing across the surface of the oceans. However, tsunamis, a type of huge destructive wave, are actually caused by earthquakes. Tides are periods of higher or lower than usual sea level. They're actually caused by the gravitational pull of the moon on Earth's ocean. The moon's gravity is strong enough to make the ocean water bulge toward the moon, which can cause significant changes in sea level throughout the day along the Earth's coast. Ocean currents are like underwater superhighways of water moving horizontally through the oceans. Tides and winds affect currents somewhat, but currents are mostly influenced by differences in ocean water temperatures and differences in ocean water density. As such, some currents made of warm water flow on the ocean surface, while other currents made of cold water flow deep beneath the surface. Most ocean currents are predictable and have followed the same general path for centuries. Several major currents are shown in the map to the right. Now, oceanography deals with the study of parts of the ocean, right? But the ocean floor underneath the ocean ranges from just a few hundred feet deep near the shore to several miles deep far from the shore. The various depths of the ocean are categorized into several categories. Now, the continental shelf is still part of the tectonic plate that makes up a continent. It just happens to be below sea level. It's still relatively shallow until the edge of the continental shelf. The continental slope and continental rise are the steep areas between the shelf and the deepest parts of the floor. The drop-off plunges from the ocean floor several kilometers beneath the ocean surface.
A watershed is a land area that channels waterfall and snowmelt to creeks, streams, and rivers, and eventually to outflow points such as reservoirs, bays, and the ocean. A delta is a low-lying, almost flat landform composed of sediments deposited where the river flows into a lake or an ocean. Deltas form when the volume of sediment deposited in a river mouth is greater than what waves, currents, and tides can erode. And you can see an image of that here to the right. Now, groundwater is water found underground in the cracks and spaces of the soil, sand, and rock. It's stored in and moves slowly through geologic formations of soil, sand, and rocks called aquifers. And you can see some of how the water table and the groundwater is sitting underneath almost all the land that is around us. Now, the control of water can be a tricky thing to look at. Flood control methods are used to reduce or prevent the detrimental effects of floodwaters or storm surge. Uh, a dam is a barrier constructed to hold back water and to raise its level, forming a reservoir used to generate electricity or as a water supply. Canals are large empty basins that allow water to flow in to a safe place rather than to flood. Uh, levees are an embankment built to prevent the overflow of a river, and a seawall, like pictured here, is an embankment or a wall to prevent the sea from encroaching in or eroding an area of land. Now, as we get into weather and climate, we want to make a differentiation between the two. You know, weather is temporary behavior of the atmosphere, what's going on at a certain time, limited to a small geographic area, and weather can change rapidly. You know, meteorology, which we've said, is the study of weather. But climate is the long-term behavior of the atmosphere, so 100 plus years, based over a large geographic area and very slow to change. Now, ele elements that can affect weather and how we measure them. So, temperature, we use a thermometer, and pressure, a barometer. The relative humidity, the amount of water in the air, a hygrometer. The height of cloud la layers is called a coelometer. And wind speed, an anemometer, which is this uh, device pictured here. High-level readings can be accomplished also using weather balloons, which many of you have probably seen before as well. Now, weather radar pinpoints where rain is falling at any given moment. A radar system works by bouncing radio waves off of the large raindrops. Uh, the Doppler effect is the change in wave frequency that occurs in energy, such as sound or light, so that as the energy moves toward or away from an observer. So meteorologists can use Doppler radar to plot the speed at which raindrops are moving toward or away from a radar station. You can see here the layout of national Doppler radar sites in the U.S., as well as a tipler, typical Doppler tower. So inside the ball is the actual radar emitter. Now, if you see, we talk radar tracks rain and precipitation. That's the image on the left. Whether satellites track actual cloud cover. You can see that on the right. So you can see the large cloud uh, patterns and movement around and you get two different bits of information about what's going on at any given time. Now weather forecasting uses two major ways to do it. So the first is a digital forecast. This is using numerical data. So this is the main method used in modern forecasting. But there's also the ability to do an analog forecast, which is comparing the current weather patterns to per patterns that took place in the past. And this is the more historical way that it's been done. And all forecasts are more reliable in the short term and less reliable in the long term. Now, obviously, all heat on the Earth ultimately is coming from the sun. So the sun is transferring thermal energy to the Earth. Now, as you can see, the Earth is tilted at about 23 degrees, and the sun's rays collide with this. They cause heating on the side of the Earth that it's facing. Now, because the Earth is being heated unevenly, both because of only the sun facing half the Earth at a time and because the Earth is tilted, this is what leads to different weather patterns and especially water temperature changes throughout the world. 
So, an air mass is a body of air with horizontally uniform temperature, humidity, and pressure. Air masses are classified by their moisture content, their source region, and their superiority to each other. So you can see on this diagram to the right some of the major air masses around North America. The movement of these masses creates a boundary known as a front, which is the cause of most weather phenomena. You may have heard of the Coriolis effect, and this happens because the Earth is rotating. So because of that, the Earth is moving underneath the air, and the air is trying to keep up with it. So the circulating air is deflected toward the right in the northern hemisphere and toward the left in the southern, and this is called the Coriolis effect. Because the Earth rotates, it's always going to follow this rotation, so it's moving to your right as you look at the picture. Now, severe weather prediction is very important because of the, uh, the severity of hurricanes, uh, you know, tornadoes, floods, things of this nature. We use satellites, reconnaissance aircraft, ships, buoys, radar, land-based platforms, along with massive computer systems are all used to, to track and predict these phenomena. As it's impossible to predict all severe weather, people who live in danger-prone areas tend to have evacuation plans in the case of hurricanes and storm cellars in the case of tornadoes. Now, we've spoken a bit about climate, that because of the Earth's axial tilt angle, its altitude and latitudes, we end up with different climatic zones. So when, when you think about the Earth being tilted, this makes our seasons change. So each hemisphere feeds more solar radiation during its summer when the hemisphere is tilted toward the sun, and less during the winter when it's tilted away. This is why we have seasons. Now, locations at higher altitude have colder temperatures. Temperature usually decreases by about 1 degree Celsius for every 100 meters in altitude. And at higher latitudes, that means further away from the equator, the sun's rays are less direct. The farther an area is from the equator, the lower its temperature. And at the pole, the sun's rays are, le are, are least direct. Much of the area is covered with ice and snow, which reflect a lot of sunlight. The major climate zones are polar, which is very cold and dry throughout the year, temperate, which has cold winters but mild summers, arid, which is hot and dry all year, tropical, hot and wet all year, Mediterranean has mild winters and hot, dry summers, and then tundra is very cold all year, but it does have plant and animal life as opposed to polar, which has very little. Now, beyond just the climates we've, zones we've talked about, there are specific landforms that can impact the climate. So take this mountain, for example. When you have the warm ocean air blows in and it hits the mountains, it's forced to go up over the barrier. And as the air moves up the windward side of the mountain, it cools and the volume decreases. As a result, humidity increases and the orographic clouds and the precipitation can develop. When the air descends from the leeward side, it is warm and dry because the moisture in the air was wrung out during the ascent. This, this area was, will have a lack of moisture and is known as a rain shadow. Now, proximity to water, uh, such as oceans, seas, large lakes, can affect the climate. Water heats and cools more slowly than land masses do. Therefore, the coastal regions will generally stay cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter, thus creating a more moderate climate with a narrower temper temperature range. This has long attracted human settlement in areas with large amounts of water for trade and transport as well as more moderate climates. Climate change is a change in global or regional climate patterns. In particular, a change apparent from the mid to late 20th century onwards and attributed largely to the increased levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide produced by the use of fossil fuels. Climate change can both happen naturally as well as be artificially caused by human impacts. Climate change has the ability to severely damage and disrupt the, glo the, the global climate and its ecosystems. For example, more heat alters ice, weather, and oceans. The, um, the climate patterns are very sensitive, and making more heat into the system can disrupt the entire process. 
this can cause human life and loss of prosperity that uh, uh, you know failed crops difficult living conditions and of course natural habits become more hostile to their inhabitants you know animals plants are finding that their habitats are becoming less um, usable to them so it's something that we have to be focused on addressing climate change but it will take the effort of our entire species in order to stop and then reverse these effects and that concludes the middle school science Module 10, and the Middle School Science Praxis Review overall. Congratulations. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I hope that we can talk to you again soon.